Today we will be discussing an approach to abdominal radiographic diagnosis in the newborn using a very simple algorithm that was taught to me by Dr. Rita Thiel, a very important mentor of mine. And it uses the mnemonic bones, stones, gas, and mass to organize our visual approach. Let's begin with bones. Are all of the expected bony structures present and are they normal? Here is a newborn with an ab abnormal abdominal exam and a normal pelvis uh, for comparison. And we notice that there is widening of the pubic symphysis is in, in this baby compared to the normal radiograph on the right because the baby on the left has bladder extrophy. Here is another baby with abdominal distension who has a nonspecific pattern of distended bowel, but in this situation the bony findings give us a clue as to the diagnosis. We see multiple segmentation abnormalities of the spine, and looking at the pelvis, we see an absence of the sacrum in a baby who has the vactoral anomaly and sacral agenesis. Next, we will be looking at stones or any abnormal calcification. We look for size, distribution and location of the calcifications, and the pattern. Here we have a newborn with an abnormal prenatal MRI in which we see a collection of amorphous calcifications in the right flank and spinal curvature. An ultrasound shows us a calcified mass that is anteriorly displacing a normal kidney and is separate from the adrenal. This baby has an extra adrenal neuroblastoma. Another baby with a large left-sided abdominal mass where the radiograph shows a pattern of amorphous calcifications in the right flank. An ultrasound shows a mass with mixed cystic and solid components. A CT was performed showing displacement of the right kidney inferior laterally by a large cystic and solid mass in the retroperitoneum. At biopsy, it was shown to be a retroperitoneal teratoma. This baby has abdominal distension with multiple dilated loops of bowel, and we notice a pattern of eggshell calcifications in the peritoneum. This baby has calcified peritoneum related to meconium peritonitis, or prenatal rupture of the bowel. Another baby with bilious vomiting shows us a pattern of eggshell calcifications in the upper abdomen, but when we focus on the pelvis, we see a large cluster of abnormal calcifications in the right hemiscrotum due to meconium peritonitis that has extended down into the right hemiscrotum by a patent processus vaginalis. Now this baby presenting with bilious vomiting has a very distended upper abdominal loop, but in the right flank we notice a collection of calcifications that looks like collapsed bowel. This is a baby who has uh, ischemic bowel and when ischemic bowel um, persists for a, several weeks, it can become calcified and um, have this appearance. Next, let's look at the uh, gas. And this means both looking at bowel gas and extraluminal gas. When we evaluate the bowel, we need to see if there is focal or diffuse distension of the bowel. Is there abnormal distribution or location of bowel? Are the patterns associated with a high or a low intestinal obstruction? Is there pneumatosis or is there too little gas present? Extraluminal gas means both the presence of pneumoperitoneum as well as portal venous gas. Here we have a six week old with bilious vomiting where the bowel gas pattern looks pretty normal except for distension of the stomach and mild distension of the duodenum. An upper GI series is performed showing malrotation of the bowel with a corkscrew appearance 
of the jejunum consistent with malrotation and volvulus. This is a baby who is very sick and has a fixed loop of bowel. And what that means is a dilated focal loop of bowel that is unchanging over several hours to days. This represents a focal ileus and often seen with ischemic bowel in babies with necrotizing enterocolitis. Along those lines, we have a baby with abdominal distension, a premature baby, and we see a mottled appearance of the bowel. Now, many times normal feces can have this appearance, but when we see little bubbles of gas in the periphery of the bowel, it increases our the likelihood that this represents pneumatosis intestinalis. And here a pathologic specimen shows us bubbles of gas in the submucosa and serosa related to pneumatosis intestinalis. Another baby who has very distended distal bowel. And here the findings are quite subtle. When I'm looking for pneumoperitoneum or pneumatosis, I use a high contrast setting on our PAC system. And here the finding is much more obvious. The baby has portal venous gas in the setting of necrotizing enterocolitis. This newborn presents with temperature instability and the x-ray on the left side was performed when the baby was relatively stable. The x-ray on the right side shows us a smaller heart and pulmonary edema because the baby is in shock. Now the reason for the shock is located below the diaphragm. Here we see a continuous line of gas in a baby with necrotizing enterocolitis and perforation of the bowel. This finding is confirmed by a decubitus view of the abdomen showing the large amount of pneumoperitoneum. This two-month-old ex preemie with vomiting shows us that we need to evaluate locations of gas that may not be in the abdomen. Here we see a collection of gas that appears to be above the diaphragm. Now, this baby has a hiatal hernia, but the hiatal hernia contains some unusual contents. Not only is there a herniation of the fundus of the stomach, there is also herniation of the transverse colon. We have two infants with bilious vomiting, and now we start looking at the patterns that are associated with high versus low intestinal obstruction. These two babies have a gasless distal abdomen and a markedly distended irregular contour of the stomach with a dilated duodenal bubble. This is the classic appearance of a duodenal atresia. We've seen this baby before with a loop of calcified bowel in the right flank and a gasless distal abdomen with focal dilatation of one proximal loop of bowel. By giving positive contrast, we see that there is marked dilatation of the jejunum related to a child with jejunal atresia and a focal ischemic loop of bowel in the right flank. Here is a baby that presents with distent abdominal distension and failure to pass meconium for 36 hours. And we see a very distended loop of bowel that appears to be colon with a mottled appearance of the feces within. And if this is colon, then our differential diagnosis going from the most distal cause of obstruction includes an imperfect anus or Hirschsprung's disease, colonic atresia or stenosis, but if it does not represent the colon, it could represent very dilated distal small bowel as a result of ileal atresia or stenosis or meconium ileus or multiple atresias. So in this situation, we did a water-soluble enema showing that in fact, this very distended loop of bowel was not colon. In fact, it was dilated distal small bowel. 
we see that the caliber of the colon is very small throughout. Baby has a microcolon. And we have reflux of contrast into the distal ileum that contains multiple filling defects. This is the result of meconium ileus. So the key teaching point here is that it is very difficult in the newborn to tell the difference between a distended colon and a very distended small bowel. Here we have two exprimis with abdominal distension that is quite intermittent and we see a collection of gas in the left in the right hemiscrotum sorry left hemiscrotum on this child and contrast containing cecum and appendix in the right hemiscrotum in a baby with inguinal hernia. These can obstruct uh, and may cause a pattern of distal small bowel obstruction. Here we have a baby with a clinical diagnosis of imperfect anus. We see that there are segmentation abnormalities in the sacrum and we notice that there is gas in the proximal urethra. A prone cross-table lateral view of the abdomen shows a distended rectum and distal colon and gas in the bladder. This confirms a diagnosis of a rectal urethral fistula. Now let's shift our attention to an evaluation of masses. And this to us means both the presence of a mass and or organomegaly. We need to see the location of the mass and it's based on the vector of displacement of other normal structures, the size of the mass and the presence of calcification or fat. Here we have an eight week old boy with fever, failure to thrive, a left upper quadrant mass and, un and an unusually shaped skull. The radiograph shows us a very dilated, very uh, enlarged spleen that is confirmed by an ultrasound. And the plain film radiograph showing a very dense appearing set of bones with abnormal ends to the bones and no distinction between the cortex and the medullary cavity in this baby with osteopetrosis and splenomegaly related to extramedullary hematopoiesis. Here we have a newborn with a cough and an incidental finding of a left paraspinal mass that is subtle on the chest x-ray but much more obvious on the plain film in a baby with neuroblastoma. Finally we have a newborn with marked abdominal distension and respiratory distress where the abdomen is gasless except for a small amount of gas in a centrally placed stomach. There is hypoplasia of the lungs with elevation of the hemidiaphragms. An ultrasound shows us marked enlargement of both kidneys with multiple tiny cysts throughout, consistent with the diagnosis of an autosomal dominant, autosomal recessive polycystic kidney disease. So in summary, we have a pattern approach that we can use for the evaluation of the uh, newborn abdomen using the mnemonic bones, stones, gas, mass. Thank you.